please welcome our featured speaker this afternoon, Jeff Dyson. Thank you for that introduction. Um, those of you who know Rod or who are close with Rod, you can send him and Carol your best thoughts or best wishes or prayers if you're religious because their eldest daughter, Lori, is, is, is deep into a very uh, lengthy struggle with breast cancer. She's had some very serious ups and downs, and uh, it's something that's obviously causing Rod and Carol quite a bit of heartache. So uh, for those of you who wish to, please keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Now, I'd like to thank uh, Timothy and Kurt Hildebrand for inviting me. You know, I'd like to put in my plug for the Mises Institute and Mises.org early on in a talk on the, well, the goodwill level in the room at its highest, generally. <laughs> but we really want Mises.org to be a resource, a free resource for libertarians. And from my perspective, obviously I'm biased. I, I don't think you can sell libertarianism to an economically illiterate populace. And that's what we've got today. Uh, and when I say sell, I really mean sell. Right, when we're talking about libertarianism, libertarian activism, especially the LP, you know, we have a sales process, product development, marketing, sales, distribution. And I really think that's how people ought to think about it. So when I got to the hotel the other night, I was watching CNN, which I generally don't do, and they were featuring these, these battles between Hillary and Bernie, Ted Cruz versus Donald Trump. And it was just unbelievable. I mean, compared to any other time in my lifetime, it was really unbelievable how monstrous it was, how monstrous it sounded. It was, uh, you know, we're, we're really living in a very strange time. And so while there's, there's a lot of good going on in the world from a libertarian perspective, not much of it is in the realm of electoral politics. And really, that's why we're here today. We're here today to talk about the libertarian movement, and in particular, the LP's role in the libertarian movement. So that means electoral politics. And when Kurt Hildebrand reached out to me and talked to him, I immediately thought the first thing that I wanted to talk about, or the only thing I wanted to talk about, was libertarian strategy. And it's a, it's a vexing topic. A lot of really smart people have grappled with this question over the years. How do we create a more libertarian world? So in theory, at least, the LP exists because some people came together and decided, well, the answer to that question is we should engage in electoral politics to create a more libertarian world. But that said, it hasn't always been that clear, has it? The LP's mission and its reason for being hasn't always been that clear. And I think the LP, just like a lot of other libertarian, libertarian organizations, has had more than one existential crisis in its lifetime. And I think it needs to examine its mission from time to time, just like every successful company does. So with that said, I have some suggestions to offer you today. And we'll get to them in due course. But the first suggestion is to apply a level of brutal honesty to everything the LP does or considers doing. Actually run the numbers, so to speak. The second is to stop being fuzzy about the point of the LP. Eliminate any doubt about the LP's goals. Set those goals, make them razor sharp, and then know if you reach them or not. And my third point today is to stop trying to be all things to all people. Resist the temptation to do this. Choose issue libertarianism over movement libertarianism. But first, for those of you who are younger in this room, we, have, we need some context when we're talking about the LP. I mean, younger people today may not really appreciate how much things have changed for the better over the last few decades for a, for a so-called capital L libertarian, right? Yeah, I remember my first car, this is the late 1980s, I was in, uh, an undergraduate in college. My first car was a piece of junk. Volkswagen Sirocco, I think it was 1200 bucks, just absolutely falling apart. And you might recall, there used to be a, a very vivid blue and white uh, legalized freedom vote libertarian bumper sticker. It was kind of split down the middle, and it had the outline of Lady Liberty on it. 
And this bumper sticker on my Volkswagen Swaco, it, it would elicit these puzzled comments from people. It was almost like some sort of sociological experiment. You know, they didn't know what a libertarian was or what that meant. It was really kind of a, a strange thing back then. And then in 1988, I was very lucky to attend a, a Ron Paul event during his presidential campaign. And I say lucky because I was lucky that I knew about it, that it was happening. Compared to today's world, it was actually an effort to know about libertarian events back then. And to talk about how much things have changed. And they literally passed the hat at this event at a hotel in Orange County, California, so that Ron and his one staffer could have gas money or hotel money and continue along the trail. You know, people, younger people don't, today don't understand the you know, Libertarian Party used to hold meetings of 10 and 20 and 30 people in, in Denny's. You know, that's what it meant to be a libertarian, really, for the first couple of decades of the party's existence. And then in 1992, I was part of a group of students in law school who brought Andre Maru to our law school campus. In hindsight, a bit of an uninspiring event for Mr. Maru. But you know, I think back to the mechanics of what was involved to bring him, and all this would be laughable to any sort of campus activist said, I mean, landline phone calls, and, and making photocopies, and, and trying to figure out who's gonna pick him up from the airport. And we, I remember we had to draw handmade maps of the campus so people would know where the building was and photocopy them and, and put them up. You know, all this is just unthinkable today. So compared to that time, the late 80s, the early 1990s, things have improved enormously for the LP and for LP candidates. And I think conventions like this, events like this, are a testament to that improvement. But if we go back to electoral politics, you know, a libertarian brand and libertarian ideas have advanced mightily in the past few decades. Political success hasn't followed, has it? You know, I wonder how many people in this room remember the name Dennis Thompson. Dennis Thompson ran for governor of California in 1990 on the Libertarian Party ticket. Now, we think about that <clears throat> only 25 years ago, the candidates for the governor of California were Pete Wilson and Diane Feinstein. Pete Wilson won that election, and he was governor of California into the late 90s. So less than 20 years ago, California had a Republican governor, as unthinkable as that is today. So why is it so unthinkable that California could have a libertarian governor 20 years from now? Well, it's not unthinkable, it's unwritten. And it's up to us to write that story. So Dennis Thompson owned a software company, and he had apparently written millions of lines of code in his time, and he was pretty much the typical libertarian at the time. He was wonkish, and he was interested in using tech to spread ideas. He was actually a real sweetheart of a man. He's, he's since passed away. So I was a very minor volunteer in this campaign. And at some point, the campaign decided to run cable TV ads. This was the strategy. Of course, back then, there weren't nearly as many cable stations, and, and running network ads was out of the question on a libertarian budget. So the cable ads that the campaign did create uh, ate up a large portion of that budget, as you can imagine. And to save money, I remember the ad was on very late at night. Okay? And a 30-second ad was the cheapest, so they bought a 30-second ad. And this ad featured Dennis Thompson almost red right in the face, because he only had 30 seconds. And he's sort of shouting a litany of libertarian promises. I'm going to cut your taxes. I'm going to get the government off your back. I'm going to get rid of red tape. You know, this was the low budget TV ad. So it turns out that depending on when they aired, these ads only reached 10 to 20,000 people each time they aired. So there wasn't really a very good return on the investment, we might say. But back then, 26 years ago, really only three ways to reach a large amount of people. It was. Radio ads, TV ads, and direct mail. All three of which are expensive, all three of which are very hard to target directly, or precisely, I should say. So, the net result of all this huffing and puffing was that Dennis got about 145,000 votes in the California gubernatorial race in 1990. It was about 1.9% of the total votes cast, which is higher, by the way, than Gary Johnson got in 2012, actually, it's just under 1% in the presidential election. So 
if we fast forward to today, I wonder what Dennis Thompson would think. I wonder what he would think of a world where we can reach thousands or even millions of people with a simple click of a button using, using the internet, using social media. I wonder what he would think of a world where it was so easy to spread ideas so cheaply and quickly. If we think about it, think about the great leveling that the digital world has given us. Think of the you know, media structures have flattened, communication channels, communications have flattened, distribution channels have flattened. But surely all this flattening must represent the greatest chance, the greatest imaginable opportunity for libertarians. But here's what hasn't flattened at all, of course, is the state itself, but also electoral politics. Electoral politics operate pretty much the same way they did 26 years ago when Dennis Thompson ran, up, ran for governor. And I think the government may end up being the last really vertically integrated dinosaur in our country. And as for politics, politics, it still remains locked down, state by state, county by county, precinct by precinct, by the same two parties with their poisonous chokehold, the same two parties who have failed to do anything for the rest of us. Now, when we look at that election in 1990, we can't actually compare it to the most recent California gubernatorial election because California passed this uh, top two ballot initiative. So the only candidates that appeared on this recent, in the recent election were the, two, the top two vote getters, which, surprise, surprise, have to be Republicans and Democrats. But if we go back to 2010, and look at the 2010 California governor's race. So with the benefit of 20 years and the digital revolution and all the hindsight available to the candidate, that the 2010 candidate for governor in California got the same 150,000 votes as Dennis Thompson got in 1990. He actually got a lower percentage of all votes cast. So what happened? It doesn't seem almost bizarre to people in this room that 20 or 25 years later, with all the leveling provided by digital media, the libertarians still only get one and two percent in statewide and national elections. How do we explain that even Ron Paul and Rand Paul, running as Republicans, managed to get so few votes in the primaries? How do we explain that Gary Johnson in 2012 raised about $2 million to Obama's $1 billion. Even in an age of communication, when spreading libertarian ideas has never been easier or faster. Well, clearly, from my perspective, as a bit of an outsider to the LP, some soul searching is required. But I think this lack of results, it raises real questions about the LP's mission, does it not? And the LP's place, in the place of political activism generally in libertarian strategy and national politics. Now, please, don't misunderstand me. I certainly don't want to blame anyone in this room, especially the younger people in the room who weren't even alive in the 1970s when the LP was created. And I never want to blame or find fault with an activist because action is always preferable to inaction in almost any area of life. But you've heard the old Ben Franklin ads, never confuse motion with action, right? I mean, the question is, is what action? What's the most effective strategy available to us, given the reality of limited resources, given the political, economic, social place that America is today? That's the question you have to wake up every day and ask yourself. That's the question for the LP. It's really a question for all of us. And so I think it all starts with this kind of ruthless, Relentless honesty. That's what companies do when they're trying to figure their way out of jail, right? They look at the numbers, they look at them ruthlessly. They don't kid themselves. I think the LP should be smarter. I think it should be more pragmatic. I think it should be more realistic about the electoral landscape that it operates in. I think you should tailor your goals and your expectations accordingly. I think you need to resist the temptation to see politics as you'd like them to be. Because America is no longer country of reflexive libertarians, it perhaps was at the turn of the 19th century, right? We forget sometimes that the 20th century was the progressive century. It changed the landscape. The central banking, social security, income taxes, 
our current foreign policy, food stamps, housing, all of these would have been considered outrageous ideas to an American at the turn of the 20th century. But today, they're part of the landscape. They're like a potted plant corn. You don't even notice it, right? They're entrenched. And these programs just form the baseline from which the political parties operate all along and suggest new programs pile on top of the baseline. So we can blame the pandering politicians for this. We can blame the media. We can blame academia for the progressive century. And they are all to blame from my perspective. But it doesn't change the fact that the country has become, or the two parties, I should say, have become irretrievably progressive. Most Americans now have a reflexive desire to have the government do something as a response to problems in society, not do nothing. So we can't say any longer that Americans are reflexively libertarian. They're reflexively progressive. Not necessarily in the left and right sense of the word, but in the sense that they want government to do something. Now, I mentioned the internet as a level, or I mentioned social media as a level, but there's a, a dark side of that, which is that we all tend to live in our own echo chambers, right? We live in bubbles of content with friends that, that are tailored to fit our own viewpoint. And that's why a million dedicated libertarians can feel like an 800 pound gorilla, right? Can be a huge movement online, but have little impact on electoral politics. And that's really what we saw with Rock Paul 2012. When libertarians are scattered all over the 50 states, their political impact is diluted. The other thing we shouldn't forget is that America is a much bigger country than it was when the LP began in 1971. It was about 207 million people at the time. It's 320 million people now. So if you think of libertarianism as an expanding galaxy, it's going out in all directions, and that's great. We're happy about that. But what if, what if the universe around it is expanding faster? That's what we have to think about. And it's also important to, ex to understand and accept the extent that the two parties have really locked down deep advantages at every level of government. And I'm not just talking about ballot access, and I'm not just talking about campaign finance. I'm talking about a federal legislature that is fundamentally structured to maintain the status quo. I mean, what does the Constitution say? Well, it says the House and Senate can establish their own proceedings. It says every 10 years there's a census. It gives Congress the power to regulate the time, manner, and place of elections, not campaigns. It says nothing about political parties, or congressional committees, or congressional leadership, or gerrymandering, or how campaigns are financed. This is stuff that Congress just made up as it went. But today we have this incredible system of two-party power and the enormous, enormous political apparatus that surrounds it. And it doesn't allow for a single libertarian or green or peace and freedom party member in Congress in a country of 320 million people. There's not a single third party person in Congress. So think about that. Now, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly enamored of the Constitution. <coughs> It's just to understand that parties have set up this wildly extra-constitutional system of patronage for themselves. And they've used the legislative process to funnel money and power to themselves. So the political class is not going to be persuaded in the face of superior libertarian arguments. That's not how it works. So my point here with regard to honesty is not to discourage anyone. On the contrary, it's to urge you to face the numbers and the facts squarely and make your tactical decisions based on that reality. This, this isn't a fair fight. There's no rules. Okay, electoral politics, when you're the third party, calls for guerrilla tactics. And there's good news, too. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, uh, there was a Gallup poll in 2014. I remember David Bowes, the Cato wrote something up about this. It said roughly 24% of Americans could be characterized as, as libertarians. It's distinct from liberal, conservative, or progressive. And my own sort of unscientific view of that is maybe 20 or 25 percent of Americans are libertarian minded. And maybe 5 or 10 percent could be characterized as actually sort of hardcore libertarians who would like to see a, a, a serious reduction in the size and scope of government. 
And that's regardless of whether they may be faux libertarian or, or identify personally as libertarians. So if you think about it that way, you should take heart because we're talking about 10 or 20 or 30 million people. And that's quite a vanguard. If history is any guide, you know, a, a small but highly influential group of people, an energized group of people, can lead whole new developments, whole new ideas. History shows time and time again that a very small group can make revolutionary changes in the society. So I think even five million really dedicated libertarians can make a huge difference. And, and this is true in part because our ideas actually work, right, when put in practice. Progressives use Uber every day. They use Uber because it works. You can't get a taxi in the suburbs. They use it because it works. They don't use it because they were, it, you know, we changed their mind about the wisdom of taxi regulations. <laughs> so take heart, but be realistic about the numbers and the system of, of itself. It's okay to have modest goals. It's okay to have short-term goals. It's okay to have progress be slower than you might like. You know, not everyone sees the world the way we do. It begs a question about nature versus nurture. Are there genetic libertarians? I don't know. But progressives have built the modern progressive world. They've built their political victories over 100 years. It may not be popular to say, but every society worth living in, every movement worth having, was built by people with time horizons beyond their own life. So that's, that's the ruthless reality. And I'm sure some of you in this room have children and grandchildren, which brings it home a little stronger. But that is the reality. And progressives are allowed to be childish, right? Progressives are allowed to never take responsibility for the consequences of their actions. But as libertarians, we can't afford to be childish and sort of stamp our feet when we don't get our way. We have to put it aside and try to be more effective. So my second point about goals, how do we deal with this ruthless reality? What's, what's the best course of action? Well, you need real, measurable, clear-cut goals for the party. Has the LP ever really done this? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not asking facetiously, but here's why. The LP, despite being a political party, has always been a party of ideas. It's always thought to make a point and to educate people about liberty. And this has always been sort of the salve for the wound of coming in a distant third place while we're educating people. Well, David Nolan talked about this when he decided to create the LP. And I know Ed Clark talked about this in 1980. And Ron Paul talked about this. And Murray Rothbard talked about this. And a lot of people in this room have probably talked about this. You know, this idea that, well, if we can't win, at least we can change some hearts and minds. People just don't know enough about liberty. And maybe this was true in the 1970s when your local bookstore only had a few Ayn Rand books, or maybe Free to Choose by Milton Friedman, and that was it. You couldn't read Hayek or Mises or Rothbard or Social Theory. It's very hard to do. But fast forward to 2016, and I say something to dump that The LP is a political party. It's not a think tank. It's not an advocacy group. It exists to engage in politics. You know, there are a million libertarian organizations and websites for people to find and consume libertarian content and to, and to learn about libertarianism, right? Anybody who wants to learn about this has 20 years to do it online. So forget about educating people. That's an ancillary benefit of running good candidates and good campaigns. The ultimate goal of the LP is to win elections. At least I think it's that simple. Simplicity focuses and it clarifies. And simplicity allows you to know if you're improving or if you're failing. Now, I, I don't think millennials have this trait. I don't sense it in millennials when I talk about it. I know some of you older libertarians in this room will know what I'm talking about. This idea of being afraid of winning, right? This fear of, of actually seeing what happens if libertarian solutions are permitted to work. This fear of leaving kind of a comfortable 1% libertarian club and the holier than thou club and having to do actual battle with the political big boys. 
This has sort of been an unacknowledged subtext, I think, in libertarianism, especially in LP libertarianism for decades. What if it actually happened? So forget that, forget education, forget fear, and decide to win. It's that simple. Now I know I cautioned you earlier about the system and numbers and the whole thing's rigged and you need patience. But so what? So what? It doesn't mean you can't have clear goals here and now. So how about this? What if the 2016, what if the Libertarian Party set as a goal for the 2016 nominee to have the same impact that Ross Perot had in 1992? We forget. He received almost 20 million votes. We forget that now. Is that too ambitious? Fine. Try to get 10 million votes, which would be about 10% of the popular vote. Still too ambitious? Okay. How about 6 million votes, or about 5% of the total electorate? I mean, is getting 5 or 10% of the total American voting populace in a year when people are so dissatisfied with Hillary and Trump, is that really so unrealistic? Or how about this? Try to get more polls, try to get more votes than the difference between the Republican and Democratic candidate in November. If you just get more votes than that, then the losing party will have to pay attention to you in the 2020 cycle. Do that alone. Get as many votes as the delta, the difference between the two major candidates, and the LP will be a force in 2020. Now, I don't know what the goal should be. It, it, it's up to you. It's up to the members of the party and your candidates. Right? Define winning and then win. National, state, local, doesn't matter. Win a certain number of votes, raise a certain amount of money, have ready goals, and then meet them. And you know what this means? It means focusing all of your energy and your time on the nuts and bolts, the blocking and tackling of campaigns. And we're talking about identifying good candidates, raising money, setting up websites, polling, direct mail, social media campaigns, voter trend, ballot access. All the stuff that we don't talk about at libertarian conferences, right? Because it's not fun. It's not fun, it's not sexy, but it's what your competition does every damn time. It means you don't need to waste time worrying about libertarian theory or speaking to libertarians even. You're supposed to be able to take your base for granted. That's what it means to be in politics. But, but I, I seriously, I, I say this seriously, I think people in this room should think about this. Is this really what you want to do with your time and energy? Because for the near term, at least, that's what electoral politics means. It's not the most enjoyable form of libertarian activism. It means seeking out people who have skills in management and tech and marketing and fundraising, instead of just people who are doctrinaire libertarians or good libertarians. And it might mean having the party forego certain races altogether. Pool your resources, the races with the best chance of success. Now, it's, it's too late now, I think, but I always thought when I first became involved in the LP that the LP should have chosen to be a state and local party that didn't even involve itself in national elections. You get a lot more bang for your buck when you're trying to raise $10,000 or you're trying to get 10,000 votes in a county supervisor race somewhere. The nuts and bolts are much easier on a small scale. And I think tactically, in a presidential election year, it might make sense to forego state and local races altogether. If you set the goals that I, that I outlined at 5 or 10%, I would go to Florida to your national convention, I would tell every libertarian in the country, no one's running for Congress, no one's running for Senate, I don't want to hear about mayor, I don't want to hear about supervisor, I don't want to hear about dog catcher. Every libertarian in the country is going to take his or her time, money, energy, effort, and pour it into, by hook or by crook, getting the LP nominee, whoever that is, 10%. And that's it. That's all we're going to do in 2016. We're not going to screw around with these other elections. That's a decision we made from the top down. That's what political parties do. They impose discipline. Right? Every libertarian should decide, is that what you want to do? Go to Florida and decide that. In, in an off year, 
Maybe there's a particular congressional district where an incumbent is retiring, there's a libertarian population in Alaska, certain parts of Idaho, Montana, Texas, wherever it might be, and there's just a perfect storm. Find that candidate, identify that, like find that race, identify a candidate, and have the whole country going guns blazing. And elect a damn libertarian to Congress. You know, you can't be all things to all people. Just because the LP is smaller and less well-funded doesn't mean it can't act tactically. And I'm very serious about that. I think, from my perspective, the LP should just run Gary Johnson or, or McAfee, whoever it is, and forget every other race in the country. In other words, run campaigns with the same level of commitment that the D's and R's to run to win. Now, there's one fly, there's one caveat, one problem, of course, and that's that the Libertarian Party calls itself a party principle, which means that your candidates can't just lie and obfuscate and pander the way the two party candidates do, right? And you have to vet your candidates somewhat to make sure they stay reasonably within certain principles and certain policy. But beyond that, I think the LP should be obsessively focused on winning, not just showing up, not just getting on the ballot, not just having a candidate, but winning. There's no reason not to play hardball and work the system. You know, win. It's a mindset the LP needs. So the last and final point I would hope to make to you today is about issues. It's about issue libertarianism. And I'm here to tell you that issue libertarianism is alive. Issue libertarianism is, is alive, it's healthy, it's growing. Movement libertarianism is dead, or at least dying on life support, and that's a good thing. Okay, all movements have a life cycle. Movement libertarianism, and by that I mean diet in the wool, top to bottom libertarians, and sort of the coalitions around them, think tanks, academics, business people, intellectuals, grassroots voters. Libertarian movement has stalled under the weight of its own growth and its own maturity, and we should all be glad of this. Factions and infighting are inevitable. They're part of all movements. Progressives and conservatives have dozens of factions. From an ideological perspective, they're good. Factions are good things. They're healthy. They clarify issues. They create competition. They force us to reconsider how to advance the return of ideas. Infighting is natural. It's not something to be feared. But it's a disaster for electoral politics. Rigid definitions, litmus tests, ideological purity demands, these are not the stuff of successful candidates. I mean, movement libertarianism was never going to create a viable political force. For most movement libertarians, that's not even the goal. But it is your goal. Trying to get voters to agree with 100% or 75% or 50% of a libertarian platform is a fool's game. It's not what politicians, and it's not what political parties do. It's certainly not what Democrats or Republicans do. I mean, there are millions of Democrats in this country who vote D no matter what is happening in the world, no matter who the candidate is. Take Social Security. There are millions of people who say, the Republicans are going to take my Social Security, the Democrats will protect it. There are millions of people in this country who say, I happen to be a minority. I'm voting Democrat, that's it. I'll never vote for Republican. There are millions of black folks in this country who say that. There are millions of union folks who say that. You know what they're called? They're called single issue voters. You can take an Italian Catholic New Jersey guy who's a union truck driver. You know what he likes to do? He likes to go to a bar and watch the New Jersey Giants. Or the New York Giants? <laughs> they play New Jersey folks. And you can take a radical left-wing lesbian feminist professor at Berkeley. And those two people might not have anything in common, intellectually, socially, financially. They might not even like each other. They might hate each other's guts, but every four years, for an instant, they come together in the ballot box and they all voted for Obama. They both voted for Obama. That is the brilliance of issue politics. You, you have to hand it to progressive, right? I mean, they're great at building a big tent, even if it's just for an instant, like I said, every four years. Now, Republicans do the same with a little bit less success. There are people who think that the Democratic Party is the party of abortion. No, no, no. I always vote Republican because of abortion. I always vote Republican because of guns. But 
But the LP has to do the same thing as if it's ever going to be a factor in national politics. The LP has to become the party of issues, party of strategic alliances, party of coalitions. I mean, why can't there be single issue libertarians? And if we just look at decriminalization of marijuana as one example, I mean, astonishing success has been made on a single issue. And the LP has been a huge part of that and gets zero credit. Right? The LP has been every bit as much a part of that as, as normal or MPP or some other groups. The LP has been talking about the drug war since the 1970s, way before anybody else. So seize the issue. Take some credit for it. I mean, we don't always notice things because they tend to happen in slow motion, but the change that's occurred with people's attitudes and opinions about marijuana is a sea change. Okay? And it hasn't happened because the states have suddenly found some newfound appreciation for the Tenth Amendment. It's happened because prohibition doesn't work and because states just get sick of it. They can't afford to incarcerate every pot smoker. So even when there's express federal law that preempts local law, some of the states are just shrugging. The federal government flat out can't enforce it. It's liberty by default on the issue of marijuana. Now there's two other issues that come to mind. I'm sure there's many more. But two come to mind for me. One of them is foreign policy, one of them is the Fed. And when it comes to foreign policy, I can't find a single ordinary person who supports maintaining an, an ongoing military presence in Iraq and Afghanistan, much less expanding in Syria or Iraq. I mean, these positions are literally almost not held by anybody outside of Beltway neoconservatives. So why can't the the Libertarian Party be a single issue party. The Fed is very much the same story. Now, ordinary Americans may not understand the mechanics of what the Fed does. So what? So why is that a crime? I mean, how many people on earth really understand the, the enormous, enormously complex machinations of the Fed? But Americans do know that it doesn't work in their interest. They know it serves a banking class and seems to make more money than it provides value to society. And they know it played a role in the Wall Street bailouts, and they know that elites support it. And that's why it became a populist issue. Against all odds, Ron Paul made this boring, wonkish idea of monetary policy. Even amongst economists, that's considered the boring part of being an economist. He made it a populist issue. And I absolutely believe Rand Paul would have done far better if he had led with it from the very beginning of this campaign. So don't be afraid of populism. You know, the old paradigm is crumbling. If you, Ralph Nader reads Mises. Bono says that capitalism will help Africa more than aid. Okay, the opportunity for coalitions and alliances is growing, not in D.C., but among voters. And these are grassroots coalitions that could have stopped the Iraq War. They could have stopped the Wall Street bailout of 2008, and they could create a groundswell for sensible marijuana laws across the world. But you have to give up movement libertarianism. It's a dead end, at least politically. Americans are results-oriented, uniquely so. We're the ones who bitch when there's a line at the grocery. Okay, the Russian through. No. Americans respond to consequentialist arguments. They don't respond to abstract ideas. Issue, li issue libertarianism gives the LP platform to argue about results instead of theory. It allows the LP to appeal to voters' immediate self-interest rather than an abstraction like personal liberty. And that's what the two parties do. If you accept reality, and if you want to win, however you define it, you have no other choice. There simply aren't enough movement libertarians. So in conclusion, I'm going to reference the late, great Gene Burns. I wonder how many people in this room remember Gene Burns. Gene was a 1984 candidate for the LP nomination for president. He didn't win. David Burton won. But he was just a wonderful, sweet man. He was a tremendous orator. He was a radio talk show host for many, many years in San Francisco and other places. He was a gourmand. He loved food and wine and reported about it on the radio. And he has an absolutely phenomenal speech that you can find on YouTube from 1991 on the nature of government. And if you saw this speech, you'd wish you could have him in your next LP convention. Just an absolutely wonderful man. 
And he came up with the freedom train analogy. He said, well, when we're talking to non-libertarians or potential libertarians, we should use this analogy of a train. You know, we want to take the freight train as far as we can to the last stop of personal liberty, but other people may not want to. They might want to just get on and go so far. They might want to get on and get off at certain stops, like gun rights, marijuana policy. But Gene said, that's fine. He said, go as far as you want. Come with us to short ways or go all the way. Take libertarian ideas as far as you're comfortable. And the LP has to make this possible for ordinary common voters. And I'll finish with this. America is not a nation of progressives. That progressives win national elections. America is not a nation of religious conservatives, but religious conservatives win national elections. How do they do it? Issue by issue, and the LP should too. Thank you very much. Thank you,
I think term limits is great just from a popular perspective. I'm not sure it would change anything. We, I mean, we have term limits, both the personality. Uh, but I think, I think it's a great issue. People love it. Um, people are very hypocritical when it comes to their own member of Congress. Very, very, very deeply hypocritical to the point where more than 90% of members of Congress are reelected when they do seek reelection. Um, but, uh, you know, to the extent that, that it may be constitutionally infirm, that doesn't really bother me. Um, so I, I say it's a great issue. We're going to talk for one more? Yeah, I think we're good. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.